Hey guys, welcome back to Tax City Unfiltered. Uh, once again, uh, we're gonna have a great podcast. We have a special guest this week, uh, Chris Novich from Austria. I think he probably doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, world famous for his videos and his uh, amazing uh, guns and rifles. By the way, we, we carry those in our store now, so props to, to, the, to Novich and his, his full line of equipment. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, we have sniper rifles in Tax City, believe it or not. Um, so, uh, with that being said, we're going to get right into this. We got a lot of questions from the viewers, from Instagram, emails, and whatnot. And uh, we're going to, well, let's first of all, start off with Chris. And uh, for those few people that have been living under a rock for the last 10 years, uh, tell us a little about yourself, Chris. How do you guys start in pay, uh, paintball? Oh, my God. Airsoft. And uh, give us a little background. All right. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, Sunny. Um, yeah, real quick about myself. I'm 28 years old. My name is Christoph. I'm an airsoft player since 15 years. I started with 14, basically. Um, I started a YouTube channel called Mobridge, which uh, I think is one of the first YouTube channels that made airsoft sniper gameplay with multiple camera perspectives, which is why it's, it kind of blew up. And from there, you know, people kept asking which gear I'm using and so on. So I jumped on a plane, flew over to Asia and got stuff uh, manufactured according to our designs and so on. And that's what's now sold at Norwich.com. So that's kind of like the history of the company Norwich and my background. Awesome. So um, were you in the military? Yes, I was in the military for multiple times actually, but it was always very short service periods. It was always just... Uh, a couple of months. Okay. I think total it was about a year. And uh, what's the last time you uh, played in the United States? Oh, I, the last time I played in the United States was in two, 2018, probably. Like what, right after I quit my job, I right. jumped on a plane, flew to LA because that's where all the airs of YouTube was happening. So I was staying over at Chad's place and I was playing at Tech City actually as well, multiple times. Ah. Uh, AC Village, American Milsim, I played a wet Bella hack. So I tried to basically travel the country and see what, what else of this they're like. And it was eye-opening. So, um, yeah, so tell yeah. me, exactly. So so tell me, uh, obviously you played in Europe, probably mo- many different fields mm-hmm. as well. Uh, big takeaways, differences between American Airsoft and European Airsoft. And, and if you want to even go within that, Outdoor to indoor. Okay, I will start with uh, Milsim. I would say European Milsims are most comparis- comparable to Milsim West, but the more, I don't want to say low effort ones because they put a lot of effort into all of them, but where there's, you know, no helicopters going on, no, I don't know, subway system or something like this. So, like, low effort Milsim. Um, What's not happening at all is something like the American Muslim Dam mission. So that was absolutely new. It was impressive for me how they set up these scenarios, you know, these kind of like um, schedule missions where you already know what's happening, but it's very cool and, and there's a lot of action going on. Um, when it comes to indoor play in Europe, you don't really, or at least not where I live, you don't have these walk on after work play a couple hours like you have it in tech city so that was really cool and was what was also impressive and extremely unique was ballet airsoft and how uh christopher Ratton, also called swamp sniper how he built the community at this field i think it was insane just you know when he when he did the safety briefing how people were actually hyped about the safety briefing like the safety briefing was not a bad part of the game day it was actually <laughs> a good part because he made it so entertaining and and it's very impressive. So, heads heads down from Christopher. Awesome, awesome. So, um, indoor out. So, like um, in Europe, uh, I, I've had some people interested in uh, French uh, taxi franchises in Europe, and one of the biggest hurdles was uh, buildings, property. So maybe yeah. that might have something to do with why there aren't any indoors in Europe because of uh, availability for buildings to be used or maybe the pricing or, or maybe it's just regulations, I don't know. But I think I, there's some 
I think I'm, I'm, I know people want an indoor, more indoors in, in Europe, but there's a lot of roadblocks. What do you think? Uh, I think there's two aspects to it. So you have Europe is very diverse. Like it's obviously multiple countries, so there's multiple cultures, uh, multiple settings for real estate and so on. And when you look towards uh, Eastern Europe, so everything east to Austria, it's called it like this. There's lots of uh, ruins. Um, basically abandoned factories, abandoned places, and this makes um, commercializing an airsoft field almost impossible because these places are for free to play at. So people go and play there. It's like two euros, so that's like uh, 2.5 USD to play there. It's insane actually, it's, it's a non-profit, so it's hard to compete, <laughs> obviously. But then you look at places like yeah. Austria, um, better developed countries like Germany, France, Spain and so on, where they basically tear everything down that's abandoned. And there I think it it fails on real estate pricing. Like rent is just any, like as, a, as an airsoft field, I think it's not as profitable as most warehouses or other businesses. So, you know, you basically compete with these companies. All of them want it, but the airsoft field is having a harder time creating profit. So they... They just can't get it. Basically, I think that's what it boils down to. Yeah, I would. I would agree. We we had some uh, prospects in France, and that definitely was the the issue was the pricing. Uh, all right, I'm gonna take let's take a few questions from some of our Instagram followers. Uh, underscore RSPG asks, "What is the best field you've played on?" The best field I've played on. And you don't have to say Tech City. <laughs> I was about to say that just to be cheesy. Okay, let's exclude Tech City because that would be unfair. Um, right. I think Balahack when it comes to outer fields, not because the field is the greatest, the field is definitely not the greatest because it's swampy and, and moist and it's horrible in a way, but at the same time, it's really cool. But the, the energy there, the vibes, the, it was just an amazing community there. Uh, when it comes to more urban areas, I think it's the one in Austria. I call it urban area, but it's a, it's basically an abandoned ammunition factory. And there was there's underground tons and stuff, so that's that, that's hard to beat this one. Oh, nice. So David underscore Treo underscore zero six asks, what's the most expensive gun you've ever owned? The most expensive airsoft gun, I would assume, um, is for sure the, funny enough, one of my very first airsoft guns, which is the BSO-10 that I upgraded back when BSO-10 upgrading was still a thing, which I think it, it became less and less and less and less. But yeah, I dropped, I dropped a good amount of money into my BSO-10. I think it was in the end close to a grand, maybe about like 800, maybe maybe a thousand wow. USD, yeah, like 800 euros. Did you? Back did then you there was find, no way. Do you find? Is, I, I'm, yeah. Huh? <laughs> Do you find? Do you do you find that at, at, at a certain point, um, as far as return for your investment, that, that that putting too much money in the gun, you're not you're not getting the same uh, bang for your buck. I mean, is there a certain point like okay, enough is enough. It's not the gun's not getting any better in performance, and I gotta stop. I I think nowadays, yes, I absolutely agree. Nowadays, I think if you spend more than five hundred bucks on your AG, you basically you just do it for the, for the fanciness of it, for just having it. But back when when I started airsoft, it like it, it was either you know expensive tuning parts or no tuning parts. And then if you have a Marui VSO10 with one tool, like good luck playing <laughs> sniping with this. So it's not that I that I <laughs> wanted to have the most expensive stuff. It's more like this was the only stuff available, and it was just super expensive. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I always think about this one story. Uh, this is back in like 2008 at my original field. Uh, a gentleman came in with a, a plastic tri-shot shotgun, right? The What looked to me like, and probably is, but looked to me like it was a SEMA, you know, or UTG shotgun, right? Yeah. And he was having a problem with it jammed, and so I, I unjammed it for him. And, and he looked on the wall because I was selling some UTG shotguns for, I don't know, 60 bucks, something like that. And he looked at it, and he, he was like, wow, why are those only 60 bucks? And I explained to him, well, why not? And he told me how much he paid for the shotgun that he had. He paid like $300 for it. And I was yeah. like shocked. I thought it was kidding. Turned out it was a Toki Maruri tri-shot, right? And I, yeah. I, I, I was like, okay, 
Okay, just because it says Tokimaruri does not make it worth $300. But apparently, you know, it, I guess Tokimaruri Maruri thinks so. And I, I, I broke the news to him, like, it, it might even be coming out of the same factory. I don't know. But I said for 60 bucks, you basically get the same gun for a third of the price. But I thought that was very interesting. Well, to be fair, if you, if you buy Marui, you still buy to a certain degree innovation. If you buy UTG, you buy you buy knockoffs. Finance, I, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's a but, tough, it's a tough call. Yeah, but if you buy Marui, I mean, Marui is still popping so, out interesting, innovative stuff. So, and UTG doesn't. So, <laughs> do you want to finance innovation or do, <laughs> right, you, right, do, right. do you not? Yeah. Let me ask you this question on that on that note. Uh, Tokimuri AEGs, how often or how popular are they in Europe? Because out here, I don't think I can remember seeing one like in years. It's tough. It's The Marui as a whole company is a big question mark to me because they, <laughs> I mean, they are by no question, they have by no question the best engineers of any years of company, but they focus all of this innovation power on the Japanese market. So they create the most amazing products for the Japanese market. Uh, uh, we had them come out, uh, I think about four years ago after SHOT Show to the visit the field and play, including the owner of Tokyo Marui, which was shocking. There was about six or seven of them. Oh, really? Yes. And uh, I got to talk through the interpreter and kind of pick their brains a little bit. Uh, and it's an interesting thing. It's kind of like when I hear about Glock, it's kind of like the old man who runs the show T TM doesn't doesn't like he doesn't actually like the fact that their pistols get modified. They like everything stock. They feel that it's perfect the way it is. And when we have all these aftermarket parts and modifying, they the older guys, the older, in charge of the company, do not like that. But the younger guys in charge, the next generation who work there, they love it. So it's very much what you hear about Glock, right? A lot of People uh, in upper management and Glock have some big ideas for the brand, but the head Hacho doesn't want to do any of that. So they're kind of waiting. They're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think when, when Marui jumps onto the Western trend of things and they take the engineering power, which they have massive engineering power, and put this into the right product. I think they're gonna kill it. I think they're gonna revolutionary, revolutionize Airsoft once again. Uh, yes, I they agree. They don't do any more at this point, in my opinion, but they will again if they push it the right, in the right direction. I agree, I agree. Lopez XER, let's see, Lopez X Eric asks, uh, top three Airsoft AEG brands. Uh, I think it depends on which price level. This is a really, 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 really tough one, actually. I would say Lonex is very high up there, but Lonex is incredible. Like, it, it's always, it's it's a mix and match because the ones that are really good are sometimes incredibly hard to get. Uh, but I would put KWA very high on the list. Crytek as well, definitely one of the higher end ones. VFC, for sure. And one that's incredibly underrated is Modify. I think Modify makes an incredible AF-15. Uh, Kilroy underscore three asks, what's the best starter M4 for players like me on a budget? I would say there's a couple of contenders. There is um, obviously the GNG combo machine. That's a quite good one. There's the Sima AK, if you like an AK. Um, and then Lancer Tactical and Spetsna Arms, which is, you know, the OEM at the same manufacturer, so very similar thing, but they have, they have good stuff. Like for the price, they're really good. I would say that's the the four the four better AGs to start with on a budget. I would agree, and I think the only one we don't have a stock is the SEMA AK, but the other three we, we regularly have. So for I, AK, I SEMA is hard to beat too. But again, the AK is not that popular. At least not. not you know what's funny though? What do, I don't know about Europe, but in America, uh, other than M4 always being around and kind of being the standard, it's weird. Uh, I would say 10 years ago, it went in waves. Like AKs are super popular, MP5s yep. are popular, P90s. And and every now and then when I introduce one of those three or something, some kind of new variant, 
it's like a brand new gun to people. It's like, wow, what happened? What? I've never seen that before. But back in the day, it was like you would see them everywhere. I, think that, I don't know what it's like that, in Europe. But. That also boils down to the performance level you can get. Because if you want a well performing P90, good luck. There is none. And you can't even, like, you don't even have an electronic <laughs> trigger unit for uh, this kind of gearbox. Like, it, it, it's not that you can't get it, you can't even make it good right now. So I, I would say the AI was the most popular platform and because it was the most popular platform there was the most development being done on it and it just kind of like performance wise it just surpassed everything else in the market and now you don't even buy it anymore because you want to have an AR but it's kind of like the best gun you can buy it. also for low prices because it's such a competitive market. I think that's what it just, yeah, yeah. snowball effect I think effect, the I P90, guess. I think that the, the appeal of it, I'm just guessing here, is it definitely had a unique look, but I, I think it was more of a, a, a size and design appeal as opposed to performance appeal, right? So the size yeah. of the battery compartment, the compact size, the, the surprising length of the barrel for such a, a, mm. a bullpup, uh, ambidextrous you know, selector switch, but, yeah. but you make a good point. Now you start getting into internals, there's only so much or not much you can do. So I it's think that's tough. kind of, maybe the new uh, players might like it until they figure it otherwise. Yeah, exactly. There's just no, there's only low low end P90s basically, or mid, mid tier, just no, right. no high end. No. Okay, let's see. Uh, this can kind of go for both of us. Uh, Nifey.001 asks, is Airsoft stolen valor? Airsoft what? Go ahead, Chris. What do you think? Is Airsoft, Airsoft stolen valor? What what what's the word? Stolen valor. valor? What what does it mean? S stolen val. Okay, stolen valor uh, in the United States would be like, um, say uh, say I was a Navy SEAL, and some guy. So stolen valor. The typical uh, example of that would be, uh, let's say let's say for argument's sake, I was a Navy SEAL. And I go into a supermarket or a party. Let's say I go to a party and some guy's saying I'm a Navy SEAL and he's not a Navy SEAL. Lying about his the valor. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? So so meaning you're, you're saying that you're somebody and you're not. They're trying to pose the question, if someone dresses up as a Navy SEAL in an airsoft environment, is that considered stolen valor? I don't think so because they... They don't necessarily say I'm a Navy SEAL. It's more like I think Navy SEALs are cool and I want to look like one. That, that's how I see it. It's actually a, giving appreciation to the Navy SEALs. Like they are cool. I want to be like them. Or at least I want to look like I want to replicate what they do. It's actually honoring them in a way. I, think. I, I don't see it like this. I know there's yeah. a lot of people who go like, oh. I, I... <laughs> yeah. There's even this one video. I think it has like 60 million views. It goes why soldiers, ex-soldiers stopped Wilson and then just rant about how people have patches of the real units, but they're not the real unit. It's, I think it's, I think it's childish, honestly. Yeah, it's silly. It's silly. I, I think the vast majority of veterans understand. I mean, if a kid dresses up as, as a military guy or a Marine or whatever, is that stolen valor? No, he's just dressing up. It's, it's if anything, you said, it's, it's kind of giving respect and honoring. That's all. He's not, as long as he's not saying I served as or this is what I, I was, no. We we kind of understand that if a guy out here on the airsoft field is dressed up as SWAT, he's not SWAT. <laughs> I mean, that would be, right. be ridiculous to assume, honestly. That's all the answer is no. It's just definitely no. Yeah. For me. So, you know, believe it or not, veterans can be uh, a, a bit whiny as well. So. If, they, if you're whining about Airsofters, Stolen Valor, you know, relax. Okay, uh, D. Uh, Zambasman asks, when can you come out and play with us? When travel restriction, when travel restriction are a bit less tough, I would assume. But I, I want to go back to the US, definitely. I want to actually kind of repeat what I've done in, I think, 2019. Just go there, maybe for years of corn, you know, to have a good reason to go and then just hop from field to field, play some massive thing in the US, definitely. So, so what are your restrictions right now coming in and out of Austria? Uh, it changes every day. Honestly, I, I lost track. 
I lost track. But I think it's not Austria being the limiting factor. I think it's the US being the limiting factor. Can I just uh, fly to the US uh, okay. right now? I think you have to go into a home quarantine for a couple of days, right? To like, post I'm not sure. Yeah, I still think you got quarantine, I believe. No. I'm uh, not sure what, how, how long and all that, but I, I think you do have to quarantine from another country. Uh, but who knows? I don't know. When will the ARP9s be back in stock? Uh, good question. Um, okay, so here's a little inside information for the, the viewers out there. Um, as a general rule, and they may notice this when they're trying to order online from vendors directly, um, anything Taiwan-based is, ha is having issues with inventory. Uh, from my understanding, from what I'm being told, is that China, so Taiwan gets a lot of their materials from China, and China is, for whatever reason, political or whatever, is kind of uh, slowing down that process of giving the materials to manufacture. From, I'm generalizing this, of course. So GNG being basically 100% Taiwanese uh, is having major issues with inventory, right? So. Uh, I can order, you know, five cases of ARP9s, and in three months I might get actually two rifles. So that's how bad it's gotten. Uh, other manufacturers like Elite Force and whatnot, they have some Taiwan, not all. So a lot of the China-based companies are doing much better as far as inventory than Taiwan-based. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, I have ARP9s on back order. Don't know when. I I would imagine I'd get get at least a handful by in the summer, but no one's. No one really knows. What about you, Chris? What what kind of issues, or, or if any, are you having with uh, your inventory? Wow, where, should, where should we even start? So we <laughs> we have we work with manufacturers <laughs> in both China and Taiwan, and it's an absolute nightmare right now. Not actually that the, I mean raw material prices increased by I think fifteen to twenty five percent. That's okay ish, but what bothers me is that. Getting a container from Taiwan to Austria or the US was like four grand and now it's 25 Jeez. grand. <laughs> so shipping costs is just through the roof. Yeah. It's like yeah, some products, they, they, it, it, they write more cost more in shipping than the actual product, which is insane. Yeah, yeah my understanding also, and I could be wrong, but I'll gain misinformation, but the containers, empty containers, Going to Taiwan has been kind of bottlenecked as well, that's, purposely. Yeah. Yes. So, but that's a, for whatever that's reason, a it's a China-Taiwan. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a longer discussion right there. It's a, it's a global yep, sure is. issue, not just the asset. Do you have a favorite pistol of the models you offer? Asks Brother Guns 468. I think it's unfair to. I of course have a favorite. The SP team is. <laughs> For sure, my favorite pistol. But to to make it fair and to not you know promote my own stuff here in, in this show is I would say my favorite pistol that I don't sell is the CZ P09, made by KJ and distributed by uh, by ESG. I think it's a fabulous pistol for us. Yes, it's well made. I gotta tell you, yeah, yeah. that's a that's a hot seller at our field. Mm, it's a great pistol. Uh, local underscore senpai asks, what is your favorite food? Favorite food? I'm not a big big foodie. Um, <laughs> not a big foodie. I, I would. Who is not a big know. foodie? Not really. I'm, I, I'm uh, just I gonna know. say. I would say. In, in an, I'm just gonna say in an out burger to make all the California people happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think yeah, it's, it's so high funny. in the list. Actually, yeah. it's it's high in the list. In an out burger is. Ah. I loved it. It was my basic nutrition when I was in the US. My daily basic really. Nutrition. Yeah. That's, that's funny. You know, it's funny. When I went to Texas a couple years ago, um, they are talking about the uh, Whataburgers. Have you been to Texas for a Whataburger? No. So, so there's always a hamburger debates across the United States, like a certain uh, regional brand or what's better and whatnot. So in Texas, they have a hamburger chain called Whataburger. Yeah. And so, you know, people will say in Texas, obviously, oh, ours is much better in and out and blows them away, blah, blah. So I go to Texas. I I, got, I have to at least try a water burger to see what the big yeah. deal is. And I have to tell you, I'd rather have uh, a Jack in a Box burger than a water burger. It's not even in the same realm. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? Now their barbecue in Texas is great, uh, but their water burger hamburgers, ugh, horrible, horrible. 
It's a bad name. I think it's even a bad name, Water Burger. Sounds sounds like yeah, water, I know. water, you know, watered beer or something. <laughs> <It> sounds <laughs> sent out. The one somehow. thing I did like. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I did like though is when you ordered your food, you sat down. It was like a fast food. You sat down. You put your number on the table, and and before your food came out, they, a guy would come by with all kinds of condiments and napkins and forks, or whatever, and he would like come out and like, do you need any of this? And he they would come to your table almost like a kind of like a waiter. I think that was kind of interesting yeah. for for a, a fast mm. food, you know. That's weird. But the burger. Okay, so Dante King one one four zero six asks, "What is your favorite real steel gun?" I really enjoyed shooting the M sixteen. I, I I like the M sixteen. The feel of it, like when you shoot it, I think it's. I would say it's either the M sixteen or the P ninety because I'm I'm a fan of low mm -hmm. recoil, and both of them are like incredibly easy. Like they almost feel like gas blowing the airsoft. It's just like they barely move. I think they're great. <laughs> these two, I awesome. go for these two. I to be it's so so funny. I I uh, I enjoyed uh, shooting a uh, a Ruger uh, Red Hawk, forty four yeah. Magnum. Yeah, well. that was kind of a fun gun. Kind of hard to handle, but it was it was fun, right? It's like a lot of power. Um, yeah. So the idea, so yeah, just about it. It's just really fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, more power. Just something about the power just felt different okay Chris so we have one more question uh, and mm -hmm. it's from Bino.O asks have you ever played Speedsoft or SpeedQB I haven't played it in the way it's supposed to be played like in in a setup area that's I guess licensed by SpeedQB which I think that's a thing mm -hmm. but I do play CQB you know quite aggressively but it's it's not there yet. It's not what people consider PQB, I think. So so rumor has I it. I rumor try. has it. Uh, so from my players that played with you when you visited Tech City uh, last time out, that you're actually a pretty pretty uh, fast guy on your feet. I do believe that playing fast is the the way forward. Okay, but you but you are pretty fast apparently. So I I uh, I. I try. <laughs> I try. <laughs> still young. Still young. Still young. There you go. You're fast when you need to be, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, Chris, uh, that's all I have on our side. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, talking to you on the podcast. Um, I hope our, our viewers and our followers found it very interesting and insightful. I'm sure we're getting a lot of comments and emails asking more questions and whatnot. Uh, but it was great having you on the show. Uh, it was great being on your show as well. I'm sure that's going to be out there as well. Uh, if you want to tell the viewers um, uh, where they can find you and uh, you know what are platforms you're on. All right. Um, yes. So Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Just type in Norwich if you want to check out products that we design here in Austria and that we test properly and make sure that you guys have a good experience. Then you can go to uh, Norwich.com and find everything there. Right, and also for all the viewers out there, uh, you can find his products uh, at Tech City for sale as well. Uh, even though uh, sniper rifles might be outgunned on the field, people play other places in Tech City, and we do sell uh, his full line of product. So with that, um, I'll say goodbye till next week. See you guys. Hey guys, that's it for this episode. Uh, as always, we will end the show with a famous quote from a famous person or character. Hint, hint. Uh, and if you know who it is, please email us at info at taxcityairsoft.com and we'll mention you on air and probably give you a special prize. Okay? So for that, here it is. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. It rhymes. Hint. Till next time. See ya.